I'm also interested because I've read about things like, you know, the forgotten crops of Africa. And before yeah. we used to have access to really, really healthy and affordable veggies and produce that we could farm ourselves. Like, so first, I guess, what happened to that? And how come now we only have access, the cheap food is not necessarily the most nutritious. When did that flip happen? It's a really good question. I mean, I, I think if the, I don't think we can point to any one date or time that that people shifted away from growing their own and, and deep cultural roots in food. Wow. What we do know now is that, um, the, the, you know, teenagers today in South Africa will be the last generation to remember that their grandmother cooked traditional meals. Um, in fact, the teenager today may well remember that their grandmother ate white bread and salami or poloni. So these deep cultural traditions in South Africa have been lost. And, mm -hmm. and without doubt, one of the main drivers has been the, the food industry is incredibly powerful in South Africa. And, and where you, and this is why I was saying food security is so deeply tied to access because in poor communities, in informal sectors, you'll see nothing but shacks for as far as the eye can see. And then there'll be a Kentucky Fried Chicken with all its lights blazing in the middle of an informal settlement. So what can people access around it, yeah. that area? What do they aspire to? Kentucky Fried Chicken. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so the food industry in South Africa has sort of stepped into a void that where there was no formal provision of food in these informal sectors, it became a market opportunity where there was um, no means of getting food into a, a deep rural village. Hand carts suddenly became a way of getting processed food, which has, which, which is shelf stable and safe into these communities. So, we, we've gone over the last 20 years from a very um, deeply culturally appropriate, healthy diet to now eating, um, really there's 50 to 60% increase in processed food in South Africa. So it might sound like something that's sort of outside the, the ambit of WWF to be worrying about processed food. Yeah. Increasingly, we're seeing how palm oil, soy, sugar, um, maize, wheat, these, these are all base ingredients into processed foods. And, and our sugar thirsty crops are crops that are farmed on a massive commercial scale. And so it, it actually does become sensible for us to be taking the lens of nutrition and processed food, because if if we can get people to think differently about their food, there is a direct feedback loop to thinking differently about how we farm that food, yeah. the, the, the um, quality or the, nutri the nutrition in the soil, which we know feeds the nutrition of the crops, which we know feeds our overall health. So the, the loop is there. Sometimes we just have to make it more explicit. And, and that still for us is, is the piece that we're working on. I think this is so interesting. I think listening to you speak now. Um, so last, no, two weekends ago, I had the, for the first time I went to Sumatra and I got to see the palm oil fields and, you know, oh, the rubber yeah. plantations and whatnot. And so it was that. And also I think also me being South African, uh, being uh, somebody who was born and raised in a village in South Africa. So I, I, what you're talking about, about food um, access and uh, nutrition and access to nutritious food, I completely get that. And now you're going back to actually the source of where some of these ingredients come from. It's really interesting. And I think also just, yeah, in, in our workspace. So I was just tying it all together mm. as you're speaking that, you know, yeah, it's quite incredible that when I'm at back home in Daung, in that village, you don't tie to what's happening in Sumatra and how that, yeah, and it, I think it, it also shows just how small the world is becoming and how, you know, local issues are global and, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, so and, then... And so for us now, it's clear that there's an opportunity to build our environmental work by understanding by building a better understanding of indigenous diets. So now um, in Essentia's actually, that's, that's her focus at the moment, um, is, is to try and understand 
what crops are um, naturally occurring in South Africa? What is the nutritional components of those crops? What role do we have? What legitimate role do we have in, in rebuilding um, the interest and adoption of those diets? So, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really interesting work. I mean, Mapani worms um, are culturally appropriate for, mo for certainly South Africa, Zim, Botswana, yeah. but they're also potentially a climate change indicator because they need, um, they need good rain cycle. And when those are lacking, then the harvest becomes problematic because um, if you're harvesting too many, because they're naturally occurring worms, if you harvest too many of those, you will you'll wipe out the supply. And yet it's such an important source of protein in, in more rural communities in these countries. So it's a very interesting and new area of work for us, but we believe it has real potential in recreating agroecological farming um, approaches. That's really interesting. By the way, have you ever tried more bunny worms? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? I have. Yeah. I like those dry ones and stuff. But at the Living Planet Conference this year, we set up a stand where we invited WWF staff to mm -hmm. cook. So some mostly South Africans, but a few Zimbabwean staff as well to cook food from um, uh, indigenous crops and um, insects from their, um, their yeah, home. Yeah. yeah. And so I had shield beetles for the first time. Oh, I've never beetles. tried that. I've, I've tried more bunny worms, not shield, not, not so beetles. Shield beetles are surprisingly yummy because they've got their own fat content. So you dry fry them and sprinkle with them. <laughs> salt. So I'm really saying something here. Um, and uh, Kodani cooked mapani worms in a mm -hmm. tomato relish. Mm -hmm. And they, they were really quite yummy. Um, bambara nuts, all sorts of things. And let me tell you, that stand was mobbed. The queue went... Oh, that's fantastic. Lunchtime, hey? Instead of people staying to eat the proper hotel... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ...to try the indigenous food. So, yeah, I have had mapani worms very recently. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've only had like the dry version. I've never had the relish because I've always thought, what if it's just too soft? But then I was explained that, no, they dry it and then mix with the relish. So it's not and, like... And they have, it's quite meaty. It's, it's mm -hmm. like it might... A more deep vegetarian than I am it would probably be a bit freaked out because it chews like a piece of steak. Ah, okay. Interesting. 